Hey ho, so um, hello everyone, welcome to the session. I'm glad to see you here this evening. Uh, and, and, and we have a session uh, with uh, Heather Snyder Quinn, uh, Typographic Obfuscation Communication for Privacy and Protest. And uh, Heather is a professor of design at DePaul University and previously taught at Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, she has worked as an experienced designer for over 24 years at agencies including like Fitch and Essential Design and many others. Um, and yeah, um, I'm happy to host you here today. And if you are ready to start the video, you can. Uh, Chad, please feel free to, to make some action to ask any questions. We will collect all of them and uh, later on, so I will read them all aloud in the Q&A section. And yeah. Hello everyone and welcome to my talk, Typographic Obfuscation, Communication for Privacy and Protest. My name is Heather Snyder Quinn. I'm an assistant professor of design at DePaul University in Chicago. I'm also co-director of our new Design Futures Lab here and co-chair of an organization called Speculative Futures Chicago. My research and pedagogy use design fiction to unsettle and challenge power structures and imagine alternate futures. This talk presents stories of creative obfuscation for communication from the past, present, and future. Examples include speculative typography that utilizes augmented reality, biotechnology, machine learning, and techniques created by non-experts, many that engage multiple senses, including voice and gesture. I'm intrigued with the human-machine relationship and the ways in which design can challenge technocratic power. I would be remiss not to talk about surveillance capitalism, defined by Shoshana Zuboff as the unilateral claiming of private human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. The data is computed and packaged as prediction products, sold into futures markets with commercial interest in knowing what we will do now, soon, and later. This research began four years ago and manifested as a publication called Transparency, Past, Present, and Future. This is an experimental publication featuring stories of the non-expert, demonstrating the breadth of human ingenuity for primal need and desire, often against much larger powers, and shows how subversive design in unsettling systems can be done by anyone. Throughout history, humans have always necessitated methods for hiding their secrets and protecting their privacy. Their methods of concealment have evolved with time. Despite more advanced technologies and even the utmost diligence, no secret is ever totally safe unless kept in the depths of one's mind. However, a speculated future indicates that not even our thoughts are secure. Technology via surveillance capitalism is regularly predicting our futures and reading our minds. In the past, we obfuscated physically with materials, primarily using cryptography and steganography through redaction, the wearing of masks, and the hiding of physical objects. In the present, we obfuscate digitally with false personas, filters, altered data, and encrypted messaging. In the future, I use design fiction to speculate that we will be internally surveilled to the very root of our DNA. As a result, we will obfuscate our bodies, our physical and emotional states. Analysis of our methods of secrecy within the silos of past, present, and future allows for a deeper understanding of our evolving human boundaries. In the present day, we struggle to understand technology's power over the fabric of our lives. If we look ahead a hundred years, what are the ethical considerations of emerging technologies? If we imagine the collapse of democracy and a future society lived in a panoptic spectacle, how would we communicate privately and freely? In this talk, I feature typographic works that are speculative and defiant and seek to undermine surveillance. We begin with the Voynich manuscript. It's 600 years old, written in a language that no one can read, 
Full of diagrams no one understands. Cryptographers have been trying to solve it for years, and it has been run through several AI systems to no avail. Researchers speculate it is either an unbreakable code or it's a hoax. It's important to note that the work here is the work of a human hand. Moving from the Voynich into examples of Nushu script, once mysterious and now much more well known, Nushu is China's secret female only script, originally believed to be a code of defiance against the patriarchy. Women and girls were discouraged and often forbidden to read or write. And so it was developed as a form of script that looked more like decoration. Although unclear exactly when its use began, it's important to note the script was suppressed by the Japanese during their invasion of China in the 1930s and 40s for fear that the Chinese could use it to send secret messages. It's no secret that times of war and oppression lead to great ingenuity in terms of secret communication and often rely on all the body and all of the senses. I show this example, especially as sensory design becomes more immersed in the design of our current day. Jeremiah Denton was a prisoner of war for eight years in Northern Vietnam. In 1966, he was forced to appear in a piece of television propaganda. It was during this segment that he used his eyes to blink Morse code, spelling out the words torture. His communication occurred right in plain sight. Communication that occurs in plain sight is also common among teenagers who often communicate with emoji symbols and cryptic memes. These communications regularly repurpose meaning. It should be noted that I have no idea what this particular code means, if anything at all. I am pretty sure though, it's something highly inappropriate. <laughs> We can talk about that in the QA. From emoji language, we move towards machine learning and the human machine relationship, starting with the CAPTCHA, which stands for completely automated public Turing test to tell humans and computers apart. The CAPTCHA was invented at Carnegie Mellon University in the year 2000. The little puzzles work because computers are not as good as humans at reading distorted text. CAPTCHA's guard against bots. Over time, though, the bots have been getting smarter, and people supposedly have not. The CAPTCHAs have been rethought by researcher Jeremy Elson, a researcher at Microsoft who has developed a CAPTCHA called Asira. It uses pictures of dogs and cats, and this particular example becomes relevant later on in this talk. <clears throat> The CAPTCHA was the inspiration behind Sandman's ZXX typeface, which this presentation uses for its own typesetting. The project started with a genuine question. How can we conceal our fundamental thoughts from artificial intelligences and those who deploy them? A typeface was created that would be unreadable by text scanning software, misdirecting information, or sometimes not giving any at all. It can be applied to huge amounts of data or to personal correspondence. ZXX is a call to action, both practically and symbolically, to raise questions about privacy. But it represents a broader urgency. How can design be used politically and socially for the codification and decodification of people's thoughts? What is a graphic design that is inherently secretive? How can graphic design reinforce privacy and really, how can the process of design engender a proactive attitude towards the future? Similarly to Project Scene, similarly to ZXS is a project called Project Scene by Emile Cazol, a typeface that can be installed and used as any other font. But once any of the trigger words is written, the font immediately crosses it out. To be specific, it recognizes words that would put you on the NSA's watch list. This way it automatically highlights and points out content prone to secret surveillance. Bookmarklet is an accessible tool developed to allow you to change any website's font to project scene. Drag the link to your browser's bookmark and click it to reveal the so-called spook words. 
In a broader way, the project explores linguistic systems through the analysis of everyday words and investigates the connection between language, data, and surveillance. Moving further from speculative into the scientific, researchers at Columbia University created Helvetica Encrypted. By embedding encryption into type blocks of text on paper using Helvetica and Times Roman. Their research details a method for making tiny changes to font that the human eye can't detect, but look entirely different to a computer vision algorithm. The idea of the invisible begs to discuss type in the virtual space, including AR and VR. As the AR cloud, AR cloud continues to grow, it's still yet to be known how companies and users will use and control the virtual space. The work of Annika Olsen of RISD explores how we might create typefaces that are specifically designed for virtual worlds. Also hidden in plain sight and only accessed via private applications or the smartphone. Lastly, in terms of privacy, I show newer research into how type and messages can be embedded in DNA. What does this mean for communication, if not now, but in terms of saving messages and archives for future generations, or as researchers have speculated, sending messages to alien life forms? While creation of typographic designs that seek privacy is in itself a form of protest, this next section has a slightly different lens with samples that seek to challenge the status quo and the hegemonic society in which we live. In this case, protest is defined as a statement or action expressing disapproval or object objection to something. We start with the work of my colleague, Laura Garcia Rossi. Her monospace typeface Fritz departs from convention and combines the functionality of monospaced fonts with swashes and ligatures that are not only rhythmic and beautiful, but carry an essence that is undeniably human. They are about exuberance, emotion, and pleasure in both the forms themselves and the messages they relay. Both historically referential and a contemporary reinterpretation, Fritz was inspired by the romance that punctuates the history of the typewriter itself, an ode to those art forms that have often been set aside as too feminine. In speaking with Laura, she also made me aware of another typeface with a similarly feminist lens. The typeface is called Nari Variable, an amazing experiment in variable font technology, which asks the question, what would it be for a typeface to be inherently feminist? To quote, the result is an interactive variable typeface designed by a woman of color, one that has multiple voices that represent choice, expression, and inclusivity does not belong to any one extreme and is fluid in nature. It breaks away from the traditional acceptable proportions of letter design and is anything but neutral. And here is Nari var variable on a sample from her website. Well, this similar challenge to hegemonic society is the work of Sir Charles who I was so happy to meet and exhibit with at the Type Force exhibit in Chicago uh, this past February. Sir Charles is a pseudonym born from the gang violence that began to plague many neighborhoods in Chicago. And this featured work here um, that you can buy, um, buy the book at Printed Matter. Sir Charles's letters are paired with mid 20th century photographs from the archives of Chicago's Urban Renewal Department. The photos preserve images of bygone structures in the oldest parts of the city. The initiative displaced many from their homes for the sake of munif municipal infrastructure projects. With a mind to contemporary parallels, Sir Charles Rizograph printed letters, symbols, and messages float through this history as a disembodied voice while demonstrating a new lettering mode combining calligraphy 
with graffiti hand styles that is both deeply indebted to and an integral product of his native city of Chicago. <clears throat> with a similar desire to preserve history and bring it back to life, the work of Vocal Type Co. seeks to diversify design, pervert and preserve culture through the crafting of typefaces. The typefaces Martin, Eva, James, and Bayard and others are recreated from historical documents centered around themes of race, ethnicity, and gender. In a similar vein, redaction is a typeface with a multiplicity of typographic, legal, and human histories. The Redaction Project seeks to highlight the abuses in the criminal justice system, in particular, the way poor and marginalized people are imprisoned for failure to pay court fees and fines. Using legal documents from claims filed by the Civil Rights Course as source material, this emphasis on text and legibility include bitmap grades of the font in order to reference the degradation of documents as they are reproduced through the legal process. By providing a range of grades from subtly analog to nearly illegible, the typeface nods to the transformation and marginalization that many people face in the criminal justice system today. And specifically, the role and responsibility of the author of the text to be conscious of legibility as a signature of power. Here's some, um, some more of redaction. I used the redaction typeface in a recent project called Mariah. Mariah is a site-specific augmented reality experience involving social justice and the law and successfully launched on the Apple Store on September 30th of this year. Mariah explores AR's potential for creating multi-layered narratives, as well as its ethical implications by virtually hacking into the Met Museum in New York and replacing Sackler donated art and signage with names and audio from victims of the opioid epidemic via augmented reality. The point of the project is twofold, activism about the epidemic, art and its corrupt funding sources, and to also raise awareness for the future implications of AR in the public and private space, our human property rights. Who owns our virtual space when the AR cloud becomes a reality? In a similar challenge to power, in 2016, I embarked on a project to embed images of protest into Google Street View. On Street View, all user uploaded images are approved through an algorithm that scans for inappropriate data. After several failed experiments, I discovered that by employing a CAPTCHA styled approach, my messages could sneak by the machine, so to speak. This particular sample was a message of protest, typographic protest, against political censorship. It was placed virtually at CDC headquarters on Street View in Atlanta when the Trump administration banned CDC officials from using seven words, including vulnerable, diversity, entitlement, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based. In another Google project, I continued to use corporate tools in ways they were not intended. In this case, experimentation with Google Translate. Lost in Translation is an experimental publication documenting my family's trip through Europe at an arts residency at Franz Masuriel Center in Casterly, Belgium. The smartphone application of Google Translate uses augmented reality via the camera, translating my family's experience in real time by overlaying original text with translations for me into English. Both the technology and the tool are still relatively new and prone to irregularity and breaking. Several of the publication pages display multiple attempts at capturing their translations and the resulting iterations. <clears throat> These so-called irregularities create experimental floating typography that capture the essence of time and place. These experiments were taken over five weeks and include over 2,000 smartphone camera screenshots. 
The experiments showcase Google's translation not only of words, but also objects and spaces that reference the shape of letter forms. These experiments create abstract collage typography that is augmented over buildings, spaces, works of art, landscapes, and so on. Many of these studies have recurring nonsense words like naked, fetus, email, slut, sin, venture capitalist, and bra, questioning the nature of the algorithm behind the tool itself. This last slide here is a combination of human-machine interaction. At the International Women's March in Spain in 2018, I attempted to utilize Google Translate to decipher the primarily, primarily Spanish language handwritten protest signs. Although you can see flickers of letters of Google trying to translate the signs, the experiment was largely unsuccessful, which leads to my conclusion about both privacy and protest. Most experienced code breakers will tell you the best form of coded communication is still created in an analog form with the human hand. This begs us to think about how we communicate now and in the future. Future speculation perhaps considers how humans might move beyond letter forms with themes of voice and gesture, as well as notions of transferable consciousness, mind and mind texting. The movie Arrival showcases a cryptographic alien alphabet that is created with logograms based on visual, not sonic communication. Production designer Patrice Vermette says, we wanted to create a language that is aesthetically interesting, but it needed to be alien to our civilization, to our technology and everything our mind knows. There's some of the logograms. Arrival's typeface was the inspiration behind my student Caroline Schlegel's speculative typeface that she created this fall in our Design Futures class. Inspired also by the editing software Grammarly, she imagines what she calls post-textual image-based communication. While this project was just a week-long exercise, she will be developing it further in the coming months. The point isn't whether or not this is feasible, but rather to unsettle our minds and challenge the systems and structures that we are accustomed to. I hope that you've enjoyed um, hearing my research and seeing some of my work. I wanted to let um, the attendees and the speakers know that I am amidst co-authoring a book uh, about speculative typography and communication design futures. If you are interested in um, or you feel you have work that might be suited to be featured in this book or you're interested in, in writing an essay, um, please contact me by December 1st at the email here. This is my contact information as well as information to download uh, the Mariah app on the App Store and um, some of the sources for the work that was referenced in this presentation. Thank you again so much for your time. Have a good day. Images of protest into Google Street View. On Street View, all user uploaded images are approved through an algorithm that scans for inappropriate data. After several failed experiments, I discovered that by employing a CAPTCHA styled approach, my messages could sneak by the machine, so to speak. This particular sample was a message of protest typographic protest against political censorship. It was placed virtually at CDC headquarters on Street View in Atlanta when the Trump administration banned CDC officials from using seven words, including vulnerable diversity, entitlement, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based. In another Google project, I continued to use corporate tools in ways they were not intended. In this case, experimentation with Google Translate. Lost in Translation is an experimental publication documenting my family's trip through Europe at an arts residency at Franz Masuriel Center in Casterly, Belgium. The smartphone application of Google Translate uses augmented reality via the camera, translating my family's experience in real time by overlaying original text with translations for me into English. Both the technology and the tool are still relatively new and prone to irregularity and breaking. 
Several of the publication pages display multiple attempts at capturing the translations and the resulting iterations. <clears throat> These so-called irregularities create experimental floating typography that capture the essence of time and place. These experiments were taken over five weeks and include over 2,000 smartphone camera screenshots. The experiments showcase Google's translation not only of words, but also objects and spaces that reference the shape of letter forms. These experiments create abstract collage typography that is augmented over buildings, spaces, works of art, landscapes, and so on. Many of these studies have recurring nonsense words like naked, fetus, email, slut, sin, venture capitalist, and bra, questioning the nature of the algorithm behind the tool itself. This last slide here is a combination of human-machine interaction. At the International Women's March in Spain in 2018, I attempted to utilize Google Translate to decipher the primarily, primarily Spanish language handwritten protest signs. Although you can see flickers of letters of Google trying to translate the signs, the experiment was largely unsuccessful, which leads to my conclusion about both privacy and protest. Most experienced code breakers will tell you the best form of coded communication is still created in an analog form with the human hand. This begs us to think about how we communicate now and in the future. Future speculation perhaps considers how humans might move beyond letter forms with themes of voice and gesture, as well as notions of transferable consciousness, mind and mind texting. The movie Arrival showcases a cryptographic alien alphabet that is created with logograms based on visual, not sonic communication. Production designer Patrice Vermette says, we wanted to create a language that is aesthetically interesting, but it needed to be alien to our civilization, to our technology, and everything our mind knows. There's some of the logograms. Arrival's typeface was the inspiration behind my student Caroline Schlegel's speculative typeface that she created this fall in our Design Futures class. Inspired also by the editing software Grammarly, she imagines what she calls post-textual image-based communication. While this project was just a week-long exercise, she will be developing it further in the coming months. The point isn't whether or not this is feasible, but rather to unsettle our minds and challenge the systems and structures that we are accustomed to. I hope that you've enjoyed um, hearing my research and seeing some of my work. I wanted to let um, the attendees and the speakers know that I am amidst co-authoring a book about speculative typography and communication design futures. If you are interested in, um, or you feel you have work that might be suited to be featured in this book, or you're interested in, in writing an essay, um, please contact me by December 1st at the email here. This is my contact information, as well as information to download uh, the Mariah app on the App Store, and um, some of the sources for the work that was referenced in this presentation. Thank you again so much for your time. Have a good day. Okay, uh, I'm back. Well, uh, very interesting topic. I can see a lot of action in the chat uh, <laughs> and yeah, very relevant thing. So I think the discussion, the upcoming discussion in Q&A is gonna be also very, very inspiring and very useful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, we are. We were all excited to see that. Uh, I think it's it's uh, extremely relevant, uh, of course. Now, while we are switching mostly to the virtual world, uh, like we have, um, we had a workshop uh, recently in our academy, which was dedicated in uh, something um, which was connected with the explore uh, with the exploration how things changed and. 
many groups they were exploring this thing of steganography and cryptography and uh, uh, yeah I've also had a brief introduction into that and it was very very nice to deepen my knowledge in that after your presentation here and yeah I Thank think you. playing with <laughs> with google hacking is going to be just a just the place to think for all of us in the evening. I'm Good. also gonna check in. I hope everybody Google hacks and just take over Street View. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, dear participants, if you have any questions, it's a great time to, to ask them. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm still thinking about that emoji, uh, emoji thing in the, <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I, I did Google. I Googled a dirty emoji teenage something. So I know yeah. it means something dirty, but I don't know. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, I know was a teenager. I mean, I'm a teenager, so I almost don't want to know what it means. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Maybe we don't want to go there in this QA, but yeah. Probably. <laughs> I've seen an octopus there at today's simian class and learned that octopus stands for mafia. Okay. I know. <laughs> oh, mafia. I mean, yeah, whatever. I just learned what the eggplant means. So I'm like clearly very old. <laughs> anyway, but if anyone wants to know how to hack Google Street View, you can reach out to me and I will tell you how to do it. So. <laughs> Yeah, and per um, the last the slide too, um, people should feel free to reach out to me. I want to make it clear that our um, the call for submissions for the book, there's actually two books. One that's speculative typography, very specifically type, and the other that's more open to speculative communication. So considering voice and gesture, more like Caroline Schlegel's student work. Um, so please don't be shy about that. It can include student work, work in progress, um, ideas. Um, it's not very formal at this point, so I just hope a lot of people will reach out about contributing to that book in some way. Yeah. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, I I hope that uh, this interaction will is gonna happen. Okay. Uh, so we have a we have a question from Laura in the chat. So she would love to hear more about how your research influences teaching, uh, how you approach teaching typography. No, uh, Laura. You should all know Laura's beautiful work was featured in my presentation. Um, so it's funny, I don't teach specifically type a lot, but I teach design futures. And in that class, we do a speculative uh, typography project. Um, and it's pretty open-minded. We have to work very hard to sort of come out of the boxes that we know, like what does communication mean for us? How would an alien communicate? Um, how would a cat communicate? I know it sounds kind of yeah. silly, but um, especially right now where we're trying to break through systems and structures that exist, especially systems and structures of oppression, I think it's really important to question sort of everything that exists, including even uh, language and type. And so I think more than anything, it just involves um, having an open mind in classes. So, yeah. <laughs> Laura. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm honored. Um, thank <laughs> you for the answer. Uh, and yeah. Kelly also writes, uh, and he would like to know how are you working with your students around the creation mm -hmm. of speculative typography? Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think we do a lot of watching of science fiction films. So they'll watch The Matrix, of course. They'll watch Her, Black Mirror, a great show on YouTube called Weird City. Um, and so the first thing I usually ask them to do is screenshot uh, speculative communication from those movies or films, um, sometimes books. So if they don't have to see it, they could be sort of um, manifesting something from a book. And then to create a new piece of speculative communication that could live in that film. Um, so it sort of helps them take the leap by working off something that already exists that is in the future in a way, or that is science fiction. Um, and then once they've done that, they're sort of looser to imagining new ways of thinking about typography or communication. And I think the movie Alien, uh, um, not Alien, um, Arrival is a pretty great example of that. Um, and the, you know, they talk about in that movie how they had um, originally the designers that were trying to come up with that alien alphabet were creating fictional alphabets based on what we knew. Um, and it took someone sort of outside our field to imagine a communication that was 
outside language and form as we know it. So uh, sometimes I think it's like uh, collaborating with people outside our fields too. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the answer. Thank you for the interesting <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, when it comes, yeah, when it comes to privacy and uh, to all these things, I I think that it really um, brings up to a lot of discussions because um, many people wonder um, how can we protect our data and uh, is there actually the necessity to protect it? Uh, because uh, not that many people believe that uh, we actually. Uh, <clears throat> Very danger uh, that it actually can bring some danger, but yes, you mentioned what if our democracy system collapses? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually really important because in Adam Greenfield's book, Radical Technologies, he talks about how in World War II, um, people uh, were not so afraid, um, and then uh, the Dutch started to collect uh, data about people, and then when the Nazis got a hold of it, they they had access to data because democracy had collapsed. And so I think it's not too far-fetched to imagine a government that's owned by Google or a government that collapses and suddenly our data is very vulnerable, um, especially with things like IoT and things like smart toilets collecting our health data. Um, it puts very, it puts all of us, but especially vulnerable populations um, at risk. So, yeah. Yeah, Christian, um, Christian is asking, so do you think that government should use the same approaches from projects you've shown, like seen, uh, to actually reduce our privacy even more? Mm. So I don't know if um, they mean like to make us more vulnerable or they should be using these to protect us. Um, I'm not sure the question, maybe a little clarity. Yeah, more vulnerable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the government could do a lot more uh, to protect us, obviously. And Project Scene and ZXX are interesting because they actually don't work in theory. I mean, Project Scene doesn't, you know, typography is set with uni Unicode. And so the data is going to see the type, even if in a visual form, it's, that it's obfuscated. Um, but the point of Project Scene is to show us, hey, don't type that word because it might put you put you on a watch list. So it's sort of like this um, making you aware of language. Um, and ZXX, the same, you know, really the same thing. So I think the important thing about design fiction or speculative typography isn't necessarily that it's protecting us, but it's making us aware of these themes um, and it's unsettling the way maybe we think about communication in the future, if that makes sense. So. I don't know if I really answered the question, but a little more vulnerable. Yes. Yeah, okay. I hope I answered it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, the next question is from Laura. So how do you think anti-surveillance uh, communication typography oh. might shape in the AR space? That's really interesting. So. AR is funny because right now you can only view as augmented reality through specific apps. Um, but future, the future, if you look at scholarship around augmented reality, um, it's that you know there's a lot of different Amazon and Google and Apple. They're all trying to buy what they call the AR cloud, um, which is so imagine a future where all AR was hosted out of one entity. So as you put your phone up, it's gonna sort of serve you different, um, different type and messages in the virtual space. And so right now, in a way, it's protected because it's image. It's not really type. Um, so it can't easily be scanned by data unless somebody actually looked at it. Um, and I think this is why sort of AR, VR worlds or, or communication is really interesting because it's so, it's so undiscovered still, um, which is why it's so important for all of us to be playing with it um, and kind of, you know, uh, looking at it before before my whole body can be augmented with slander or ratings um, or my house can show my credit rating or how much mortgage I own or an ad can be placed here. Right now, any of that is perfectly legal. Uh, so it's really interesting uh, just from a privacy surveillance point of view and of course messaging. So I don't know if I totally answered Laura's question, but I work with her so I can answer her in person too. <laughs> 
Um, okay, we have another question from Claudia. Um, so, had the app particularly uh, was impacted by the Morse code with the eyes, the image you showed in oh, your presentation? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so thank you. Do you know another examples of this kind of things? Oh, I have so many. So my entire thesis uh, is about creative obfuscation. And for the purposes of this talk, I tried to keep the lens pretty specific to typography. Um, but Morse code is amazing because it's sort of like a base for multiple forms of communication through object and senses. So um, there's a lot of women who knitted Morse code into socks in World War II. Uh, windmills were actually positioned in different ways to communicate Morse code. Um, a million, million other things. Those are just a couple of examples. Um, and I've always been fascinated with the sample of Jeremiah Denton because, you know, if any of you have a Wii or you do gaming with gesture um, or you think about how we're communicating with Alexa and Siri, like communication is clearly moving towards multiple senses. And so I think when we look back to history and we look at communication that wasn't just um, visual, you know, letter forms. Um, it's it's just really kind of interesting in terms of thinking about privacy or, or just futures in general. So, yeah, yeah, I could go down. I could talk about that for hours, but we won't do that right now. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have an ongoing PhD about censorship and speculative typography. Oh, wow. No, oh, amazing. Please, uh, yeah, contact me. That's great. Good luck with your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, please reach out to me, Christian. That's great. Oh, wow, I'm looking at the psychotherapy in Finland had been hacked. That's so crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, probably all of you have read about, you know, you talk to your phone, you, you, you can, you can hack your data by pretending you're somebody that you're not right. Um, but it's pretty hard to hide um, in di the digital space, which is why most cryptographers will say the safest form of communication is still analog by hand. Um, so, you know, I don't have a lot to say about that yet moving forward. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we have another question from Kelly, uh, and she wonders yeah, what mm -hmm. promoted the interest for your upcoming book? <laughs> what was I mean, for? yeah, I think it's nice to sort of think about this idea of creative obfuscation through the lens of type, because I haven't seen that done a lot. Um, and I really, when whenever I research type um, and then... And I find either speculative type or, of course, type that's addressing privacy. I think it's really beautiful. Probably some of you have seen the type that um, was all built on the sounds of New York City. And so I sort of collect all these like these things that are outside the norm of what we see. Um, and so I think, it, you know, the book is obviously inspired by opening our minds to new ways of thinking, which I think is really important right now in particular. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, we have a lot of Midwestern friends on this chat. <laughs> I faced my, my first, uh, I don't know, um, probably not very pleasant experience uh, with this stenography because I was the victim. Uh, I didn't yeah. know that uh, a person can uh, can find out about my location uh, using the information from just simply an image which I sent to him. It basically carries yeah all of the information my so where it was done, uh, my IP and uh, yeah I was. Oh, uh, I didn't I didn't know that either. I mean, if you look like yeah. there's crazy technologies coming out. One in particular, like if you go on a date with somebody. There, I forget the name of it, um, but it can read if your date likes you by looking at pupil dilation, body heat, certain ticks in your body, your baseline. If you have not watched the show Lie to Me, you should completely watch that. Um, and then, yeah, there's a, there was another app that came out and I feel like got censored, but I can't remember. And it was like, if you passed somebody on the street and you thought they were cute, you could take their picture scan it into this app and it could tell you everything about them, like sort of based on facial recognition, but I think other biometrics. Um, and I think that one was 
sort of, you know, uh, limited. But mm -hmm. I mean, part of the problem is that um, technology companies move faster than the law. And so there's no case law or statutes. And so they are able to move far ahead before anything is established to really protect us. And so um, I feel really, I feel like that's why speculative design is so important because we can be sort of trying out scenarios before Google and Amazon and everybody else mm -hmm. does. And then we have agency to say this maybe shouldn't happen, um, at least in theory. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm reading the chat and laughing. Everyone wants that dating app though, probably. I mean, in theory, if I was younger, it seems kind of fun or not. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> Let me check if we have any just any questions. Okay. Um, a big problem is that much of this personality test stuff is bogus. Uh, just feeding our <laughs> immense desire for uh, for secret knowledge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know it's totally true. It's almost like a tarot card reading or something, right? Like, how do you, how do you know? Um, so it's sort of, sort of fascinating to think that by reading our biometrics, they might they might know. Um, yeah, psychographic spying. And I think that uh, it's Lawrence, right? That's a really important point. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time sort of analyzing lie detector tests and most most research will show you they're not very accurate. Um, those are like an early form of biometric reading, right? Um, and, and, you know, whether it's psychology or current day biometrics, retina and thumbprints and other kinds of you know, baseline data. I mean, I think that's why I'm so fascinated why the show with the show lie to me too. So if you've not watched that, um, they will watch people and look for a baseline. So everyone has like a tick when they're lying. Like I lick my lips when I'm lying. <laughs> now you know when I'm lying, right? Um, and so the I think that's really interesting because that show is like biometrics before computer biometrics, like just by observing a human, which is really interesting. So yeah real psychographic spying i mean surveillance has always been done right even before computers it was done just in an analog fashion so it's really interesting to sort of study I mean, it's the importance of studying humanities and history too right so yeah i think that's a really good point i guess people who are having some overthinking uh, issues uh i don't know they might caught in an anxiety attack after uh, after just realizing how actually uh, yeah. dangerous it can be. I know, I know. But I mean, we're apathetic too, right? We kind of also don't care that we're being spied on. Yeah. I'm just like yeah. that, right? We're just yeah, too busy. I guess yeah. Everyone gets used to and doesn't even complain about the fact that she, I don't know, your uh, some advertisements in the Facebook, uh, they are right. just I don't know, tracked. And uh, uh, only 30 minutes ago, you mentioned some <laughs> yellow duck, and now it's yeah. already on your yeah. advertisement list. I know. We're